I'd like to talk tonight about how a sermon, if you were to pick it apart and look at its framework and look at the, the inside of it, why do some communications have a certain thing to them and others don't? Oftentimes I think we respond with kind of intuitive, sometimes emotional language about, well that kind of had this and that kind of had this, but oftentimes there are reasons why. So let's look at a couple of them. So I begin here with the premise. A sermon has an engine, an energy source. A sermon comes from somewhere. There is something driving this. There is some reason why you got up and shared this. Now to get at um, what I mean by this, I'm trying to use all sorts of different language in case you think about an energy source, huh? But an engine, oh, I can get that, okay. I'd say it this way. Why are you saying this about a given teaching? If I were to ask you a series of questions, if you sat down and said, I'm just, what are your thoughts on this? I'm getting ready to give this. I would say, well, why are you saying this? Why do we need to hear this? Why should we care? Why do you care? Why not do something else on that day or in that morning or next week or whatever? Why not do so? Why this? What is it within this that these people in this time need to hear this? What's the spark, the impulse, the insight, the twist, the revelation, the truth, the picture, the reality that has compelled you to say these things to these people at this time? And, and what is that in 30 seconds or less? Oftentimes, if you ask somebody about to give a teaching, give me the thing you can tell how well it's gonna go based on how hard they've worked to distill what that engine, that spark, that something is. And what that generally comes from is lots and lots of work figuring out what exactly is, in the fewest amount of words, the thing that's driving this whole thing. The sermon is an ancient, sacred art form, and it's time for a generation to recapture it. Make sense? Like, th there's a whole bunch of things that are driven, that circle around that. And oftentimes, the harder we work at getting what is that, or what are those few things that everything moves around, the, the more you discover just what that energy source is and how it's all connected, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, oftentimes, a sermon centers around a moment. Sometimes it can center around a movement, and other times, it's driven by a mystery. I'm sure you have your own language and have your own experiences, but let me walk you through a couple examples. Early in the morning, as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry, seen a fig tree by the road. He went up to it but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. Now oftentimes this teaching is a bit of like, and then Jesus was hungry and just kind of in a bad mood. This is why we don't eat Fig Newtons, or something along those lines. Now, I actually, um, we had a dead, withered fig tree, and before I threw it out, I thought to myself, that's in the Bible, I may use it someday. <laughs> so I tossed it in the woods behind our house, and it spent the winter in a pile of junk that we put out there and pretend like it doesn't exist, and went out and got it the other morning. That is a dead, pathetic, withered fig tree. Now, let me give you a couple little details. Jesus is on his way back to the city. What was in the center of the city? The temple. The fig tree in first century Jewish culture was a symbol of Jewish spiritual leadership and authority. Jesus is on his way into the city to the temple where he is going to essentially declare that the temple is irrelevant. And on the way in, he curses a fig tree, which is a symbol of Jewish religious establishment. If you go around cursing the symbol of the religious establishment, the religious establishment isn't gonna go for that. What does Jesus do on the way into the city? He burns the flag. Correct? I mean, th this is a loaded religious, social, political gesture that he does. If you were a disciple, I assume you'd be like, like a rap battle, oh, he did it. Uh. <laughs> I mean, that, whew, he curses the fig tree. Essentially, he's saying some things about what's coming. This entire system, this entire military, industrial, economic, religious complex is going down because it is turned essentially against God and God is bringing judgment to it. 
because it's no longer the fundamental way you come to God. You now come to God through me. I mean, cursing a fig tree could get you killed. And, and so, if you're teaching on this, there is this moment when Jesus curses the fig tree, and so essentially, as you add historical context to it, it's almost like you build these rings extending out. It is this moment, the first time uh, I was stumbled upon somewhere what the fig tree was a symbol of, I was reading along, I was like, oh, oh my word. Well, that story, all of a sudden, that thing, there is something there. How many of you have had those moments? So essentially, if you're going to communicate that, then somehow at the heart of that teaching, there are these details you are going to give. And as you give each round of detail, hopefully what is happening is the implications and the consequences people are already beginning to fill in in their own minds. And so the sermon essentially centers around the moment when he curses the fig tree and then it moves out from there. Another example, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, it's in the top like thousand. <laughs> now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. This is later in the story. Naaman is now in Israel looking for healing. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. And Naaman gets deeply offended by this. I mean, he's the general, and the prophet is like, just, just go wash yourself. What? What? I could do that in a river back home. Next, later on. Uh, he actually um, ultimately does get healed because his servants say, you should do what Elijah said to do. And then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Let's keep it there. Now at this time, people had what's called, an understanding of what's called localized deities. There was this region that had this God, and then there was this region that had this God, and then this region had this God. So he's living in Aram, and his God of Aram can't heal him. So he goes over to Israel, and the God of Israel does heal him. So he enters in to Israel with a localized deity consciousness. Each area has its own God that does the healing and the work in that place. He gets healed and essentially converts not just to the God of Israel, but to an expanded consciousness of not just each area, but this particular deity is the deity of the whole world. This is a huge leap he has just made. So he is, as he converted, as he switched over, however you want to say it, everything has opened up for him. This God is different. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. Now he's a military general, he's just gotten healed by the God of Israel, but now he has to go back where? Home, yeah, back to the land of, Rimam is the God. Now, as he's parting with the prophet, he says, okay, one final thing. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple of Ramon to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow there also. When I bow down in the temple of Ramon, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. Now, um, what does Elijah say? He says, essentially, when I go back there, it's gonna get really complicated really fast. And I'm gonna end up in this position where my boss goes into the temple of Ramon to worship, and when he bows down, I'm gonna have to bow down in the temple of my, my previous God. And Elijah says, well, you either stand for something or you fall for nothing. Turn or burn, baby, are you with us or not? It's really quite eloquent what Elijah says. Are you gonna stand up or not, okay? No compromise, God doesn't allow compromise. We stand on the absolute truths of the word of God. No. Go in peace, Elijah said. Peace being the Hebrew word shalom. There's this moment when he's about to head home. 
His whole life has changed. Everything's opened up. And he says, okay, there's this problem though. I'm gonna go back into a world that's it's a bit ambiguous and it's a bit fuzzy. And I'm loyal to this God, but my life, there are certain things that happen. And just please, please may the Lord forgive me for some of the awkward things that my life entails. And Elisha's response is, go in the peace and shalom and blessing and wholeness of God. I mean, is that a beautiful moment or what? There is this, be- it's almost like this ache you can picture this ache in his voice. Oh, he's like facing the next day. Oh, this could get really complicated really fast. Now, I'm gonna show you a picture of a temple. If I were preaching this, how many people in your congregations following Jesus into their everyday life presents them with a multitude of ambiguous, fuzzy situations when it's not crystal clear exactly what the right thing to do is. How many of you, whether it's you or the people that you speak to, when you say things or when they're told things like, you know what, it's pretty black and white, just do what the Bible says. It raises a certain sort of anxiety with them Their heart is right, they want to do the right thing, but there are complicated, ethical, logistical issues for them to follow Jesus in what they do. How many of you have had people come to you for spiritual direction or counseling, and they presented kind of what they're struggling with as a follower of Jesus, and you're thinking the whole time, okay, that is complicated. How many people in your congregation could relate to the prayer of Naaman. And sometimes we do people this huge disservice when people are told this stuff. You know what, you just stand for Jesus and you just take a stand no matter what. And they're like, okay, okay, I got that, I'm with it. It's just let me share with you the exact situation I'm in. It's a bit fuzzy. How many people could, it would serve them such a great degree if you were to say, you know what, some things are fuzzy and ambiguous. We're gonna have ambiguous fuzzy Sunday where we're going to acknowledge that sometimes it's just that way and you just can't erase the tension or solve it right now here today. It just is what it is. Are you with me? And so if you're teaching that, essentially there's this moment when, I remember the first time I stumbled across this and the what he said and then Elijah's response, there was like this, And then the whole teaching essentially centers around that moment. So probably, what's that teaching about? Following God puts us in some awkward situations which may be exactly where God wants us to be. Now, if he goes back to Aram, he goes back a changed man. Who else is going to spread the message of the God of Israel but Aram? Because he's gonna go back and he's going to be healed and he's going to tell his what? Yes, we need him to go back into that situation because that's how they're going to hear about the God of the whole world. So there is this moment, Jesus curses a fig tree. Uh, Naaman has a sort of request And Elijah's response is, go in shalom, go in shalom. Go in a trusting knowledge that God will give you the next right step to take. You're okay. You've had enough conversion for one day. Just relax. Sometimes a teaching centers around a moment. That's where it gets its energy. There's this thing that captured you, you stumbled upon it, and you were like, whoa, that preaches. Other times, a teaching Uh, can center around a movement that you stumbled upon. I love the fact that when you meet Jacob in Genesis 27, he's at, who is it? And Jacob said to his father, I am Esau. When you first meet him, he's trying to be someone else. And then the journey, like you follow him all over all these 
ups and downs and bends and curves. And then in Genesis 32, when he finally gets done wrestling and the sun is coming up, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. And so essentially we first meet him and he's trying to be somebody else. And then there's this moment later on when he's asked who he is and he's finally comfortable in his own skin. And it's almost like it's then that God gives him a sort of destiny. Like, do we have that worked out? Because I got some stuff for you to do. Now that we got all those, some of your issues worked out, now we can get to work. And so, uh, in teaching that, there's a sort of movement there of what happens to this guy as he becomes more and more comfortable in his own skin until there's this moment. And actually, the what is your name, Jacob, he answered, when you realize the first place that we meet him, all of a sudden the story comes to life. Whoa, now we have a story. Make sense? So it's a sort of, it's, not, it's less about a moment and more about like a, a movement that unfolds. Or maybe another one's like this. Oh, I love this one. Matthew 7, do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. How, how many of you have at one time or another thought, that's one of the most bizarre things somebody has ever said? Yeah, throwing your pearls before swine. Here, buddy, come on, buddy, come on, buddy. You see, don't do it, there's no point, right? It's just, they just like, it's just, okay, I, I won't. The problem with the teaching is this, this wasn't something that I was tempted to do in the first place. I, there, it wasn't like, I was, should I or should I not? Jesus says, no, that's all I needed. The light has shown. Yeah, don't, and people say, hey, you know what, I'm just casting your pearls before a swine. I am? Because I don't have any pearls and I don't have any swine and I'm fuzzy and I want them to meet. Now, let's back up to the section before it. The section before it is what? Chapter seven begins verse one. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, it's the do not judge part. So the pig comes after the don't judge. Well, what's before do not judge? Do not judge is the end of chapter six. And the end of chapter six is a section about, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink. And, and it has this great line, and your heavenly father knows that you need these things. So out of the do not worry, by worrying you can't add an hour to your life. Out of the do not worry, we get the don't judge and then we get, don't cast your pearls before pigs. Well, wait. If you're not to worry because your heavenly Father knows that you need them, then Jesus is saying, life in the kingdom is about entrusting your physical needs to God entrusting yourself to God so that you live without worry and anxiety. This is central to the life of Jesus. Judging is condemning people. It is marginalizing people. It is showing them contempt and disfavor as a way to control them. Perhaps, if we treat you in this way, in some way we'll be able to shame you, distance you, correct you, rebuke you, maybe in some twisted way, get you to see how flawed you are and then you will see that we're right or something along those lines. To judge is to try and essentially control somebody through negativity. And then a pearl is a good thing. Pearls are good, correct? Now, pigs have a purpose. So it isn't something bad to something bad, and it isn't something good to something good. It's something good to something else that is unable to appreciate or understand its goodness. A pig doesn't go, oh, I know what to do with these. A pig has no ability to discern the goodness of the pearl. Would you agree? The way of Jesus and the life of the kingdom is about entrusting yourself to God's care. 
the way of the kingdom is about entrusting others to God's care. And one of the ways we refuse to entrust others is we condemn and judge as a way to control. But the life of the kingdom is about surrendering and trusting yourself to God and then surrendering and entrusting others to God. One of the ways we don't surrender and entrust is we try and control through judging and condemning. We also sometimes try and control through giving good things to people, but they aren't able to appreciate them. And so he is saying, as your heart begins to align with God's, that will then lead to entrusting others to God, which means you will be less controlling through negative things and you will be less controlling through good things. How many of you know a kid who had Christian education rammed down their throat at a stage of development that wasn't appropriate and they want nothing to do with it? Is it a good thing to educate people in the way of Jesus? Yes, but is there a chance that this person was not ready for it? And so entrusting them would be an awareness. Now, what would that teaching be then? There is a sort of movement, and as you get a hold of what's happening in this section of the Sermon on the Mount, all sorts of meanings and applications begin to kind of crackle and pop. Would you agree? And so if you're teaching this, maybe you start with the, the pigs part, but then you gotta back up. And so hopefully by the time you come back to the pigs thing, it's like, whoa, all of a sudden the pigs passage is starting to mean a bit more. Notice this, uh, Psalm one. Blessed are those who do not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or sit in the company of mockers. Blessed are those who do not walk who do not stand, who do not sit. There is a movement here. We get in trouble first, we begin walking with something and we shouldn't be walking with it. And then uh, we start standing around it. We stop just walking with it, now we're standing around with it. And if we get sucked in even further, we may even sit down. And once you've sat down, it's easy while you're walking to simply stop walking or walking in a different direction. While you're standing, it's not as easy, but it's easier to just, I don't really wanna stand next to that. But when you're sitting, it becomes harder and harder to get up and walk away from it. How many people do you know who got caught up in something that started because they just began walking with it, it seemed harmless, and then they ended up stopping for a moment, and they ended up sitting down, and now they're way deep, and we're trying to help them get out. Are you with me? Yeah, that's how sin works. And so as you begin to see a sort of movement in it, that teaches. Whew. Is there anything you are walking with right now? Is there anything you are standing around? Is there any way in which you sat down? So we need to talk about that. And you're having trouble getting up because you got comfortable. Now, uh, next. So you have moment, you have movement. Another way perhaps you could say it is mystery. Philippians chapter one, Paul says, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. Genesis. has this phrase, in the beginning, it's then a long poem about how God keeps things, things are good, and then it ends with, thus the heavens and the earth were completed. Now if you're a good Jew, you always notice the arrangement of words, and big, unique words, you always know, and then when you get multiple big, unique words, and in the New Testament, they kind of mirror the Hebrew scriptures, you realize this writer is brilliant, he's making connections here. Is it possible that when Paul says, began a good work completed, that a good Jew who knows the Torah would be like, wait, beginning, good, completion? That's right there in the beginning. Is that brilliant or what, by the way? <laughs> what might Paul be saying? When you opened yourself up to God's redeeming love, 
you were opening yourself up to the same nuclear creative energy that made the world. The God who began a good work in you will take care of you. The God who created the solar system, when you surrender to that God, I think you're gonna be okay. And so it's less a sort of moment, a sort of narrative moment, and it's less really a movement, it's almost like a mystery. It's almost like, okay, what are the implications of that? You know what I mean? It's like, whoa. There's gotta be another layer to that, and another layer, and another layer, and another layer. Or this one, I love. If you look at the Ten Commandments, the first nine commandments are all externally discernible. If you kill somebody, I can watch that. If you steal something, I can see it. If you bow down to another god, I can watch you bow down to another god. The first of the, ni- first of the Ten Commandments, the first nine, you can see externally. The tenth, is you shall not covet. I could be coveting right now. You don't know. (laughs) You might be coveting my fig tree. (laughs) We don't know. Now why is that? There's this fascinating ancient commentary that says, oh, that's because the 10th command is a command, but it's also a reward. When you follow the first nine, you won't want anybody else's life. (laughs) They say you ought to read it like a progression. And when you live in harmony and obedience to God, when you find your place in God, then you won't want to be any other place. Well, that's an insight that to me, okay, there's a teaching in there somewhere. How many of you are like, can I have that? Yes, you may. (laughs) How many of you had that? Like, okay, there's something there. I don't know what it is. Right now, it's like three minutes long, but I'm sure I can find another 20 or so. (laughs) How many of you, that insight, for you, there's a sort of like, that's got a certain energy, that's got a certain hum to it. Yeah, 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 you can give me that in 30 seconds or less. Maybe the 10th commandment is, is, is a commandment. Maybe we should also think about it as a reward. Bust that out on someone. Because it's like when you do the first nine, then you don't want anybody else's life. Yeah, yeah, so, so, so if you're teaching that, and maybe that's it, then that's a certain, that's an energy, that's a spark, that's an insight, that's a something. It's humming. You don't know exactly where it's gonna hum, but it's got some life to it. So if I was doing this teaching, if you can get that down. Now, notice Revelation chapter four. And there before me was a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones in the center around the throne. And then I saw a lamb. These are all taken intermittently throughout the chapter. Looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center. Now, Revelation four and five is this vision John has of the throne of God. He speaks of someone sitting on it. God's throne designed by Philippe Stark for cartel, thank you. Now, uh, (laughs) the picture is of circles. There's one on the the throne, and then around are 24 other thrones, and then around the elders, and then around, and as as the passage progresses, and all the living creatures in heaven and on earth and under the earth, it just keeps building. It's almost like they just keep turning on lights, and you're, oh, there's an upper deck. Oh man, this is a stadium, whoa. It's like John just keeps turning lights on and so there's more and more and more and what is the visual, visual, like pictorial kind of representation of it is it's all circles and in the center, everybody is facing in every living thing in the universe because there's one on the throne that is higher and above and ineffable and majestic and everybody knows that the action is there. I mean, I instantly start thinking about things like the psychology of worship. We gather once a week to remind ourselves that there's a center to the universe and it's not us. The psychological power of gathering together to be reminded that there is a throne and I am not on it. If you're preaching this, it's it's less really about a moment And it's less really about a particular progression, it's more like a picture that has infinite depth that can be explored and discovered. Does that make sense? It's like you build a picture and then you you can just think about it psychologically. Why do we sing these songs on a regular basis? 
because they remind us of our proper place in the cosmos. And that's really good for us on a regular basis. Why do we gather? Why do we gather? Because it's important to remember that the worship service doesn't start at 11. The worship service started infinity ago. At 11, we're just joining what's been going on for a long time. We don't like start it, we join it. Come on. So, Perhaps you have other ways to describe what happens, but my experience has been that you have this spark, this impulse, this moment, and something seizes you, something grabs you, and you're like, okay, there's something there. There's something there, there's something there. There's an energy source, and that energy source takes a bunch of different forms. Everything in a sermon is related to everything else in the sermon. So there are all these parts, and the parts of a sermon are all interlocking and related and they all work off each other. They're all related to each other. They give and take from each other. They push and pull from each other. So we need to understand and name the parts, know the parts, be aware of the parts, feel the parts, step outside of the parts. There is the part where you simply read about Jesus cursing the fig tree. That's just reading the text. There is the details surrounding the first century historical word of Je- world of Jesus. There are the implications of what he does for his own life. There are then the questions that it raises about Jesus. There are then the leap to this world. And so a teaching has all of these different components that come together. And what you are doing is you are handling them and arranging them in a purposeful way. So when you're putting something together, is this a story? Okay, this is a story. What does this story evoke? How does it begin? How does it end? When I tell this story, at the end of the story, where are people? Is this kind of funny? Is this strange? Is this kind of a quirky, is this deeply emotional and meaningful? Sometimes I've heard great stuff but I felt like the person didn't realize what they were handling. Does that make sense? Like, okay, that story that you just told, okay, when you tell that story, at the end, pause and just give us space to recover from what you just told us. Don't go charging into your next point. Know that story and know what it's going to do. Here, here's, um, there is, if I were to name parts, there is reading the passage. Some parts of a sermon may be information. This is just, I gotta give people the Hebrew word here. It's just, I just, there's a couple pieces of information people need. Now, if you give me a sermon in which you just give me all sorts of information in a row, by the end, I'm going to be doing what? Sleeping, Sleeping exactly. There are stories. But if you give me a whole teaching of stories, by the end I'm gonna be like, all you did was tell stories. If you just ask questions, at some point I'm gonna be like, you know those are really provocative questions, but, but is, do, you know, do you know anything? <laughs> <laughs> there is the rant. There are moments when just go for it. But if you go for it the whole time, we will be exhausted and completely stressed out of our minds. We will be wondering what your issues are. We will, we will be concerned for your blood pressure and ours. Um, there is action. Okay, at this point in the teaching, just throw the pearls at the pig. Just, just do that. <laughs> there is an insight. There is, a, there, is, there is an insight. Uh, the sermon opens you up to critique and misunderstanding and judgment and criticism and baggage and agendas and it also opens up truth and repentance and hope and light, correct? That would be an insight you are offering people. 
There is an insight here. Um, there are observations. Have you ever noticed when you pull up to a light that some stereos are louder than others? Some make your car vibrate. Oh, yes. Have you ever noticed that some people have what are called subwoofers? There's a What's that about? Let's talk about that. Where does that come from? What is that? There is the observation. You are simply pulling apart a particular thing. Have you ever noticed? What about? What about? There is the statistic. Sometimes, just, I need to give you a few facts before we talk about something else. Today we're going to talk about complaining. Before I talk about complaining, I just need to show you how many people in the world live in substandard housing. And just show you how many people in our country don't have health insurance. And just show me how many people in our city can't afford heat. Before, before we talk about complaining, I just need to show you a few stats. <laughs> so, there is the declaration. Sometimes what you need is somebody to say, here is what we are about. And here's where it's headed. And here's what God is doing. And here's what it looks like. And who's with me? Sometimes, what is, some, some parts, now if the whole thing is a declaration, well after a while we're like, who do you think you are? <laughs> Correct? But there are moments when you need to just, you need to stop asking questions when you need a declaration. There are other moments, stop making declaration and start asking some questions. And then, uh, oh, an invitation. Sometimes, sometimes it's, uh, I want to invite you right now to entrust your children to God so that you don't turn them away from the faith because you keep stuffing things down their throat that they can't yet appreciate. The key, of course, is knowing what you're handling. So this thing that I'm looking at, okay, that, that's definitely a rant. I can't wait to let that one go. But if I go too long, or if I don't do it well, uh, so what comes after the rant? What comes before the question? And so often what a teaching is, it is knowing and arranging a flow. If you don't know the parts, and you don't know what you're handling, sometimes what can happen is the teaching has this movement. Let's pray. <laughs> Correct, it's like just a straight line. There's no up, there's no down, there's no here, there's no there. It's just poof. But when you begin to know these parts, as you're working on something and you have this story, okay, what is this story? Okay, I just came across this Hebrew word, and so I gotta explain to people the Hebrew word, and I gotta give them a couple other passages where the Hebrew word is to give them a fuller sense of how the word was used. So there's a section on information, but the reason why this has got me so fired up is because once you see kind of what the word means and how it's used in that story, oh man, the, the implications. There's at least a couple implications that instantly come out. So I'm gonna move from, I just gotta give you a couple, a couple pieces of information, to reading the text to, okay, now, I'm, I'm in a different place because now I'm starting to take what I just showed them and I'm beginning to extract what it might mean. Does that make sense? Let me show you something. I hesitated to show this to you, but let's just show it to you, and it's pretty ugly, but anyway. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here to talk about the sermon. For some people, the sermon is to be endured. For some, it's to be evaluated. For others, it's pure propaganda, and for some, it's like a boat anchor around their neck. The Bible is just, ugh, boring me out of my mind. No, there's, a, oh, fairgrounds. Have you ever stood there and felt totally alone and vulnerable? Uh, what was that? Oh, is anybody listening to me? Um, crickets, the old Rob, and then that really long run on paragraph. <laughs> and yet a number of us have gathered. Does this sound familiar, by the way? You're like, I swear I heard this somewhere. I don't know where. <laughs> um, then there was Ezekiel, Acts, Jeremiah, Mark, Isaiah, and Luke passage. And then there was this, the possibility of and then there was a clip from the Rites of Spring, and then there was Acts 17, some of them sneered, and then there was Goran Krop, who rode his bike from Sweden to Mount Everest and then rode home. And then there was this God said, words create new worlds, and then there were these kind of at the end, 
Uh, just an overview of we're going to start theological, go to conceptual, which is where we are now, and then some practical and some personal, and two, this idea of talks that start talks, and then three, kind of the re-up, the recommitment, the there are some things I got to go home and resolve to do. So that's, um, it's a bit like um, sausage in the law. If you love it and respect it, don't watch it be made. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that came out of nowhere. What in the world? Um, now, I would say uh, a couple of thoughts. Know the parts, name the parts, be familiar with the parts. Um, if there were like 14 different passages, it might have been like, okay, you're kind of losing me. If there would have been like six, seven, eight, nine, ten, you would have been like, I don't really know what. what, what. So, so, how many of you on one and two last night were like, where is this headed? You weren't? How many of you were wondering, where is this headed? Okay, so I can create a little tension. I can create a, a little, where in the world is this headed? I can leave you a little like, what is this whole deal? Okay, I'm kind of with this, but where I can create, and I need to be careful because if I've created tension, you're listening. Where is this headed? You're asking where is this headed? But there's a point at which that tension would turn on me and you start to check out because I haven't given you any sense of where we're headed, correct? So there's a, a sense in which how long can I keep people in this before I have to actually hand them a little something? And when I hand them a little, oh, this is starting to, if I then from there on out have no tension, then you're like, okay, now it's totally prickly. How many of you heard a sermon where they opened with a story and you were like, this is brilliant. Where is this headed? I cannot believe how they're gonna save this thing. And the thing just exploded and then the rest of the sermon was And you're like, oh man, they like, they like oh. It started so, I was like, where in the world is this going? Oh, this is where it's going. Oh. <laughs> How many of you know exactly what I'm talking about? And you're like, oh man, you could have at least bored us and then told the story at the end. <laughs> uh, right here with fairgrounds, and is anybody listening to what I'm saying and with crickets, I'm hoping in those moments that you are having your own crickets moments. I'm hoping you can relate. I'm hoping you've had the, man, that was just like the old whoever. Somebody longing for why can't, and, and it was absolutely, totally hurtful. And you're like, why do I put myself through this? How many of you had somewhere in there a sort of, you're right, why do I put myself through this? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's, there's a sort of, um, I'm, looking, I'm looking for us all to have a shared experience. Oh, yeah, 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 I know about that. I know about the tension thing where it's like all these things are supposed to balance perfectly. And then, so, uh, whether, whether it's helpful or not, part of it is knowing. I'm hoping that when we got to the possibility and we got to all of the things that we are risking when we put ourselves out there, I'm hoping that there was a sense of, yes, that's it. That's why this is so messy and confusing and inspiring and compelling and wonderful is it's all of these things at the same time. So my experience has been that something powerful happens as you begin to know and name these and then it's carefully arranging it so that you know where you're headed. And hopefully, uh, an editor told me recently that when he reads a novel for the first time uh, that has been submitted to him, he said, I have my editor hat on. So I'm looking at all of these things that a book editor looks at. He says, sometimes I start reading something and it's so well done that I can take my editor hat off and I can just enjoy it. And this is what he said, he said, I can stop being an editor because a couple pages I, in, I realize I'm in good hands. And this is not about entertaining and this is not about performing, hopefully, this is about working hard for the glory of God so that when people listen, they know they're in good hands. This person isn't gonna manipulate me. They aren't gonna give me a rant for two hours. They aren't just gonna bore me with all sorts of data and information. All of those things 
can be unbelievably powerful when they are arranged and all of the parts are related to all of the parts well. You have speed. How fast do you go? Well, if you are giving people Hebrew words, you probably don't do the words like this. Uh, the word for confession is the word yaha, Y-A-D-H-A-H. The word is yadha. <laughs> you, you probably don't do it that way, correct? You probably also don't do this. You know, I found out yesterday my neighbor has cancer, and uh, <laughs> correct? Like, you, you handle those differently. So there's this sort of, there's, you have speed, you have intensity. Some things need to have a something to them, but if intensity is in the wrong places, you're like, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. He's up there. Other times, we need the intensity, because if you don't care about this, how are we gonna care about this? So there's this sort of navigating the intensity. You have pacing. You have really fast. You have really slow. You have medium. You have all of these parts. Now what is this part right here? Now what is this part right here? Now what is this part right here? I think right here we need to move along we need to move along at a fair pace because what I want to do is I want to show them how Paul mentions this concept in five different places. So I want to take them there because I want to kind of give them an overview of that. So that's just a little work we've got to do and the reason why I need to take them to these places is because when I get down here, we're going to start to extract some deeper truths out of what Paul does with those five different texts. So when I take them to these five texts, I kinda gotta keep it moving because we're headed somewhere, and so what's gonna happen later is going to deeply affect how I handle this part. Does that make sense? And so what time sometimes happens is the whole thing begins to flatline because there isn't an awareness of what is coming. All of the parts relate to all of the other parts. How many of you have ever told a story to start the sermon and it was awesome and in fact it was too awesome because the teaching never recovered? <laughs> How many of you had this feeling where you realize you're getting towards the end of the sermon and you realize my best moment is in the rear view mirror? <laughs> it's the sense in which you had this thing and you thought I, I'm gonna get everybody's attention and then later you're thinking that was nice but what I want is all of their attention now. So, uh, there is this, I've literally had moments when I realized, I don't know if the sermon can recover from that opening. Oh, I know what it is. The opening is actually the ending. Why? Because I'm looking at all these parts and I'm realizing, I don't know if we can, oh, I know what I do. I don't, these people are going to sit here at least for the first 10, 15 minutes, whether it's engaging or not. I got a couple minutes on the front end where I can get that work done. I can just say, I want to begin by taking you to these four different passages. And people are, I wonder what this is about. An excellent question you want there. Because if they're asking what this is about, they are listening. They're engaged, yeah. It's not manipulative, it's not controlling, it's just understanding. Let me begin here. I just want to read you a story. Now, notice in the story a couple of things. Boom, boom, boom. This raises a profound question. Boom. Now let me tell you a couple of statistics. Boom, boom, boom. Whoa. Now everything is starting to, and then you end with, I'll tell you what happened to me the other day. Oh, and all of the sudden what happened to me the other day is a living embodiment of the story we started with. Does that make sense? Know those parts, name those parts. I would argue that what you want to be doing towards the end you don't still want to be accumulating content. Not good. But I would argue, up until the last minute, one of the best things you can be doing is arranging. Because it means you got all the stuff. 
you know it so well that you're now just going, oh. I have had stuff where by the end I was like, well, I, I, the parts were like deep in there, and I've had sermons where in the first service it was this way, and there was this realization part way through, oh, and then in between service, this goes here, and this goes here, and this goes here, ah. I did a thing um, a while ago, it was called Everything is Spiritual. It was kind of long, and uh, <laughs> it, it, was a, it, it ended up, the only way I could create a framework, like that dr sketch that I showed you, is I had to put it on three by five cards and lay them out on the floor. It was 102 three by five cards. And then it had to be laid out like this so that I could stand over it because it wouldn't fit on a computer screen. Um, and then it was like this. Like that. It took a little bit longer than that, but nevertheless. Uh, <laughs> and that's not, frame, that, that's just, it's hard work, but a lot of biblical stories, the storyteller knows exactly what to tell you and exactly what not to tell you. The storyteller is hiding things and then pulling them out at various moments. There is the art of creating tension in the room and then there is knowing when to relieve that tension and then to create new tension. Now, uh, pacing, tone, posture, there is the physicality of even how you are presenting this. Because sometimes you are right here, come on. And other times, I think this is back here. I think this is over here. I think there is a certain posture to how you are presenting this. Are you presenting this as a sort of, okay, this is how it is. Or as this part of the thing, I think this is a whole series of sketches. What about this, what about this, what about this, what about this, what about this? So there is the way in which you know what this content is, and it has worked on you, which we'll get into tomorrow. These parts have worked on you. You have been wrestling with living the life that God gave you in such a way that you don't want anybody else's life. You have gone in to that insight about the Ten Commandments and it has shaped you and transformed you and changed you. So these, this, that stuff that was just a new insight has become a part of you and you've lived with it and then when you are giving it, you are so in tune with what it is that you are real, okay, this moment is slower, this moment is faster. Or, and then you have uh, an arc. Where is this thing headed? Where is this thing going? Is this thing going up? Is this going to land quietly? What is the, the pitch of this thing? Where are we going to be at the end of this? Some teachings land with a sort of defiant rousing, and so boom, 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 and every, yeah, da, 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 or whatever that is. Ah, 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 don't get it, don't get it, whatever that is in your thing. <laughs> whatever it is in your thing. Um, other times it's like, okay, here's what I need. Um, I think this lands at a bunch of questions. There's, there's like three or four questions that, that, that I keep coming, that I think the text rate, that the whole teaching raises. I feel like, like a harp player who could just play and we could just methodically, quietly go through a list of questions. Oh, you know what this, I feel like this one, this one lands, there's this story, I ran into these people the other day at the grocery store and they told me the story about something that happened to them involving somebody else in the church and it's one of those like, it's everything we're about. I think this teaching lands with, and now I'd like so and so to come up and they're just gonna tell you a story and all this stuff I've been building, they're gonna tell the story, it's gonna be like, whoa, that's it, that's it, that's it. Make sense? So there's this sort of, okay, where does this thing, what is this thing? Where does this land? How does it feel? What is it doing to me? How has it affected me? Um, yeah, there are openers that overwhelm. Um, it's knowing that how I start this thing, I gotta make sure I can recover from it. Sometimes it needs to be just <laughs> um, and it's great. It's great, but just knowing, okay, if I'm gonna start like that, then I need to know what I'm handling because the rest of the thing, sometimes a whole teaching can ride on the energy of how it exploded in the beginning, and the rest of the sermon is essentially just picking up the pieces. There are no rules to how you get it across other than at least know what you're doing. 
If you're going to keep people totally in the dark for 30 minutes on what in the world this means, just know what you're doing there. Here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna see how far I can keep this thing elusive and the tension. And the reason I'm doing that is because somewhere towards the end, it's all gonna start to make sense. And what's gonna happen is all of that huh, huh, huh is going to get translated into a oh. You just gotta know, okay, then, then that's what I'm doing here. So even if I, please turn your Bibles to, okay, the other day I was, da, da, at least there is, oh really, I'm turning to my Bible, but now he's off here. So I guess at some point we're gonna do what? Right, so right there. Or perhaps people walk in and they're handed something. What's this for? I wonder what this is for. That's a great move, by the way. Or people walk in and there's something on the stage. <laughs> great, great. Apparently at some point something's gonna go down. I'll take all the help I can get. But even that is like, just that has hopefully created something. I guess at some point we're gonna at some point, we're gonna to get to that. It's like already sitting there. You've already in the room planted an element of tension, and tension is your friend. Just know how your friend behaves. <laughs> that sucker will turn on you. It's not pretty. Uh, I've also discovered that probably that sketch that I showed you of the opening night, there, that I have several more outlines that are, that are much, much more in detail, but I thought that, that's like almost like an overview. Um, can I go back to that one for a second? Yeah. I should probably say something here. Sometimes people talk about memorizing. Well, how do you memorize? How do, but the things I've observed from people who really seem to have it way, way, way deep down, and it seems almost like they're just talking, like where in the world is the outline? Do they have that all in their brain? Whenever I observe people who have that, I'm always in awe of it. Um, that thing is broken down. Um, into its major components. So, uh, dear, uh, dearly beloved, four things, five things, six things, circle, um, God said, one, two, three, correct? So, it's not an hour and 15 minutes of words in there like word, 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 word. There is a 10,000 foot altitude, a 20,000 foot altitude, a 30,000 foot altitude. I don't know what that is. That's um, probably about as high. So there are multiple points under Ezekiel, there are multiple points under Acts, but I left those out of this because that's a sort of, so I just begin and there's a four, and there's a five, and there's a six. So I've broken it down into its smallest piece. You can't memorize the whole thing, but you can know the parts. And if you know the parts, can you memorize four things? Could you memorize three things? Great, so now you have seven things you've just memorized. <laughs> Give each part a name. There is the Bible examples of what a sermon is part. There is the really brutal things that have happened to me because I'm a preacher part. There is the ways people in our culture sometimes see the sermon part. Does that make sense? So it may be an hour and 15 minutes, but it is that whole opening dearly beloved thing, which whatever, whatever that was, and then there is the endured evaluated part, and then there is the humiliating things part, and then there is the Bible part, and then there is the rites of spring, Acts 17, Gordon Crop part. So maybe an hour and 15 minutes, but it's actually four sentences. Does that make sense? Name those parts, because if you know the part and the name becomes a trigger, then you might know two words, but those two words might each trigger two parts, and those two words might actually represent 11 minutes of content. And so what seemed like, how am I gonna memorize all that? Well, if each part has a name, and you know the names, and you've arranged how the names work, I start there, then there are these four things, and there are those two stories, and then those three insights, and then those one scripture, and then that story and that prayer. There it is, that might have been 47 minutes, but you have broken it down into its smallest components, and each of those names opens up a whole new thing, but because you knew the one part, and it's easy to remember the one part, you have broken it down into its smallest components, and so all of a sudden a very long thing, like 
seven hours over three days of teaching becomes just a couple of words up there. Does this help at all? I'm like, well, is this working or not? Okay. So I think sometimes what happens is people are like, oh my goodness, that was like 37 minutes. How am I going to do that? Well, just ask yourself first, if I know the part, okay, what are the parts? Start naming the things. Here's another thing. And there are all sorts of ways you can do this spatially and physically. Uh, I have done physical outlines before. The first part was that whole tree thing. Second part was that sitting thing. Third part was a pig thing. And the fourth part was a chair. So my notes were objects. Where am I? Um, I'm at the end of the crate thing. <laughs> and nobody knows. Take each part of your sermon, ask yourself, is there anything in that part that has something that physically represents, and then just set it up on the stage. And then when you're wondering where is next, oh, it's the, it's the ceramic frog part. I don't know, it's the, it's the scrub brush from my kitchen sink part. I don't know, whatever, whatever it associates, I'll take all the help I can get. People are like, wow, you knew that whole thing. Well, well actually I have jumper cables, duct tape, <laughs> Um, a license plate, and then a dog collar. Yeah. That's what I needed that, apparently for that sermon. I don't know what that is. <laughs> Be free with all of this. I've done outlines that I laid across the floor in giant art paper. It's like this high, and it's a giant roll. I've done outlines that I walked on. And so I was like, where am I? Oh yeah, I guess I'm right here. Right here, right here. I'll take all the help I can get. I don't know about you. I'm a bit slow, but I get a little, any guidance, any help to this. Know the parts, name the parts, and then everything starts to open up. Now here is an example. Um, I'm hoping with this that when we got to the criticism, misunderstanding, gossip, rumor, baggage part, which also is the possibility of truth, hope, repentance, etc. I'm hoping that something powerful happens there. I'm hoping that's a moment. That feels in some senses like the emotional center of what I was trying to say. Does that make sense? That's, like for me at least, in working on that, that's it, that's it. Working, working, working. And how would I summarize this thing that we do? It has like, it's like a double-edged sword. It's the highest of highs, and it can be the lowest of lows. It's like you soar, and sometimes it's like you crash land on concrete. You know, it's like, that. oh, I know what it is. It's that, it's that, it's that. And so everything, hopefully, is sort of heading towards that. This is what we do when we preach. We open ourselves up to da 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 and also the possibility of da 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 So when I start here, the dearly beloved knows that the possibility slide is uh, it's probably an hour away. But then everything as it relates to everything else is being shaped by that. Perhaps you've been working on something and, and you came and you realize, oh, that is Oh, that is, I've had moments sitting at my desk when I was like, oh, thank you, God, that is so beautiful. Like I had my own sort of, I got preached to. Okay, this thing just worked on me. What worked on me? Oh, that's it. Okay, what are the words? Okay, how do I describe it? How can I work really, really, really hard to get that sucker down so it's not just, well, you know, it's like God loves us and God cares about it and we have this, okay, no, 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 boom. Give me the nugget because if you can't do it for me crisply and cleanly in 10 or 20 seconds, how are you gonna do it in 40 minutes? Does that make sense? And sometimes what you can tell is it's called circling the runway and not landing. This preacher has a great impulse and a great thing happened to them, and it aroused within them all sorts of powerful learning and ideas and truths. And They had a transformed moment with this story, this text, whatever. It did something to them, but they didn't do the really hard work of figuring out how to articulate that. And so they're in the teaching, and they're just going, they're like <laughs> going round and round the control tower, trying to get us 
to see what they saw. And we kind of get hints of it, but they're starting to get frustrated because they aren't able to convey to us what it was to them. Does that make sense? So no wonder the thing is kind of like trying to find out where it lands, but when they do that really, really hard work, then it's like, oh, yes, then we can see what they saw. Uh, next, let's go, let's go forward again. I think after this was the one we already looked at again. Okay, a sermon, let's do one more. A sermon creates a picture, a space, an image, an experience, an encounter, a world, a place that allows people to find themselves in it. When a sermon is really doing something, the gift that you are giving is you are creating something that people then enter into, and as they enter into it, they find themselves in it. So perhaps for you, sometimes you've had this sense like when they were like, okay, now I'm going to apply this passage. How many of you ever heard that kind of language? This is the application of that passage. And sometimes something for you is like, oh, 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 it feels like we're ruining something really beautiful. And it's not because you're against applying it. Something about the now we're going to apply it took something like this and did this to it. Correct? At the exact moment when what it needed to do was do this. So all of the sudden, this thing that we just experienced became lessons for marriage. And you're like, but I'm not married. So I'd love to be a part of that whole thing. But you landed it there. So the question is, how to take that big, beautiful thing, and at that moment, it goes so huge that married or unmarried, or whatever, rich, poor, whatever the thing was about, opens up rather than closes at key moments. Now, uh, so, so there is this, and, and I want to go into detail on this, there is a sort of, it's really focused, and yet it's also in a strange way really open. It, it is, a bunch of things were actually said, but what did something to me was what was unsaid. It was defining and it actually said things and articulated them and defined, and yet at the same time, it was sort of imagining, it sort of created a whole new series of questions and worlds and ideas. And, and it, was, it was very resolute, like this is what's going down, and yet at the same time, there was a bunch of things that were unresolved. See, a sermon, could, oh, oh, here's an example. A man had two sons. The younger son said to the father, give you my share of the inheritance. And the father gave him his share of the inheritance and the son took it and left and squandered all he had. Now how many of you have at some point in your life heard the story of the forgiving father and you were like, I am totally the younger son? How many of you at certain points in your life I've heard the story of the forgiving father and thought, I am the elder brother. How many of you have had a moment in your life when you were the father who blessed and welcomed someone home? How many of you at different points in your journey have been different characters in the story? How many of you have been a village member and been like, that is one messed up family? <laughs> You know why we're still talking about the parable of the prodigal son, which really isn't the parable of the prodigal son. It's actually about the father and about the other older brother as much as the younger brother, nevertheless. You know why we're still talking about that story? Because it's very resolute in the story that it tells about the forgiving love of the father, and yet it's also very unresolved in terms of exactly who are you in the story. It's lots of things are said and yet all this stuff circling around it that's left unsaid. And so the beauty of that story is it is told in such a way that you can find yourself in it. It's like creating this space 
where people can go, oh, that's me. Oh, that's the gift you give. So, so one of the things in knowing the parts, naming the parts, arranging the parts, figuring out what this thing is thinking, okay, this thing is this, okay, what does this mean? What is the thing behind the thing? What does this do in the room? How does this person who's going to hear this, hear this? How does that group of people, how does that family, how does that couple interact with this? How do I create this? Now, now here's um, one way um, to look at this, and this is where things get really interesting. You have people in your congregation who are at A, and the beauty would be to articulate something in a sermon that would invite them to come to B. You have people in your congregation who are at B, and the beauty would be to invite them to C. You have people in your congregation who are at K, H-I-J-K-L, and the beautiful thing would be for them to go to L. You have people across the spectrum. The beautiful thing that can happen in a sermon is when everybody is met where they are and invited to the next place. How in this teaching can I think through where people are in their journey and at key moments pull back and craft it in such a way that I didn't just hit this but I realize there's something else going on here, and if I hit that, it will include all of these other things. That is the mystery and the art and the discipline of, of this, is creating something where people can find themselves in it wherever they're at. Sometimes you will find pastors who just wish their congregation would get more whatever, uh, justice-oriented, evangelistic, generous, um, cool, whatever. <laughs> I just wish they would get more, whatever. Well, in some cases, you're upset because the people at B aren't coming to K. Let's just work on B to C for those folks, correct? Sometimes there's this, I just wish people would share their faith more. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Do these people know their own story? They may not know their own story, and you're upset because they're not sharing their story and the story with other people. Well, wait, 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 do they know their own story? Let's start there. Because we may be asking people and may be frustrated that they aren't there, and actually, we have people here. Um, here's an example, tithing. It is very easy for a sermon on tithing to land at, everybody should give 10%. And so what happens is this big idea gets down to this, it's almost like a pinpoint. Well what happens as we're landing it, trying to make it practical, is people are dropping like flies, because this isn't about me, correct? I got debts, I got unbelievable debts, I can't be doing 10% right now. Okay, so maybe then you back up, tithing. Well, well tithing's about giving, and giving's about generosity, and generosity is about your view of the cosmos. Is the universe generous, or is it a zero-sum sort of thing? Is scarcity how the universe works, or abundant generosity? Because actually, that view is gonna shape a whole bunch of things. Well, wait, what is the Trinity? Well, the Trinity is about this community of three in oneness, endless self-giving generous love among the members of the Trinity. So the Trinity is unbelievably crucial because it argues that the universe at its center is an endless self-giving community of loving oneness. Come on now. Doctor, nothing more exciting. Now, <laughs> this is actually unbelievably relevant because your view of what's at the base of the universe will deeply shape a whole bunch of other things. So, is God a generous God? and we get to step in to that endless circle of generosity and giving and receiving? Or is the central story of the universe scarcity? There's only a little bit. I need to grab my piece and hold on tight because it might get yanked from me. Are we preaching yet? Now, 
in your congregation. You may have people who have massive, massive, massive debt. So if we're gonna talk about tithing, there's a bunch of people who instantly go, okay, I owe an unbelievable amount of money. So for these folks, they're at like negative B, negative C, or some other, <laughs> they're like to the left way. Like, okay, so the first thing is let's help them get out of debt and not burden them with a bunch of tithing talk. Correct? So, so let's, let's meet each person where they are on the spectrum and say, what does it mean for you to enter into the generosity of the universe. Now one of the things churches do is this practice of tithing, which is a way of constantly disciplining myself with my checkbook, because my checkbook is deeply connected with my heart. Constantly entering into the discipline of, I want to participate with what God is doing in the world because my generosity, I want to be part of a larger generosity. And so you ask the question, how do I meet each person where they are at? One time we had a guest teacher who talked on tithing and said, well, you're supposed to be loyal to Christ and loyal to Christ is 10%, and so if you don't tithe, that's fine, you just aren't loyal to Christ. My sister ran into a woman, a single mother with three kids with severe disabilities, sobbing in the parking lot, who said, I have so much debt and the cost of the education for my kids because of all their medication and special needs, I can't give 10%, sobbing in the parking lot, so I must not be able to be loyal to Christ. I have a rash. Um, <laughs> so perhaps for this single mother, Perhaps a sermon in tithing is, perhaps you are here today and you can't pay your bills. And so what we wanna ask you to do afterwards is come down front and tell us because there's a bunch of other people who are gonna give their 10% to you. Are you with me? And so all of a sudden what you've done, what you've done is essentially said, okay, 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 where are people on this? Where is the redemptive movement? and the invitation is to meet God where you're at and just go to the next place. And that might look different for a bunch of people. And so what you wanna do is get the larger, what is your view of the universe? What's at the bedrock thing? What's the thing behind the thing behind the thing? Because if I can get at that, it's gonna open it up to all sorts. But what a sermon does is it creates this space it creates this experience, it creates this moment. Sometimes what you're doing is you are building a cathedral of words and you are inviting people to walk through the front door and stand there and go, oh, it's beautiful. Oh, that's a pretty good one, isn't it? I like that. <laughs> Sometimes you're just creating a space and you're moving around it. Sometimes you're just moving around it and you're just letting it start to do its thing, you're letting it like leap to life. Sometimes you've just got this thing and you're just painting a picture and you know what you're doing with it and so you're laying out, there was this circle and then around them were these thrones and then around them were these living beings and in the middle was a lamb looking as if it had been slain. And then I realized, oh my word, there are living creatures. And then I realized all the living creatures and then I realized, whoa, the heavens have an upper deck. And as I realized it got bigger and bigger and bigger and so you're just building this picture and as you're building this picture of the center of the universe with someone, that's not working right now. Um, as you're building this picture, <laughs> hopefully what's happening is people are starting to see themselves. You know what happens for me is sometimes I start to think that that's my chair and things start to fall apart. And so what I have to do is endlessly remember that there is a throne at the center of the universe with someone sitting on it, and I don't have to sit in it. I don't need that weight. I get a little judgmental. I start to get a little upset. And this person deserves that. And this person needs to be condemned for that. And what that's really doing is I like to sit there and make the judgments. And the one on the throne says, my chair. So it frees me to entrust others that I don't have to live like that. And so you're simply creating a space. And so we gather once a week to remind ourselves that there's someone running the show and it's not us. Because sometimes we start to get a little heavy and the, the walk, the walk is, gets a little funky because we're loaded down with weight that we don't need to carry and so we remind ourselves that there's one on the throne and it's not us. And so hopefully what happens is you are creating space and people are going, oh, that helps. 
Oh, that's a new perspective. Oh, I need to hear that. Are you with me? It's the gift that you can give. There were three disciples walking home from the rabbi's house on one Sabbath Eve, a Friday night. And they would get together each Friday night and they would read from the book of creation and they would discuss it with the rabbi. And as they're walking home, the one of them says to the other two disciples, you know what, I, I just want to apologize, but uh, tonight it was like the rabbi and I talked the whole time and the two of you didn't get a chance to talk and I feel so bad about that, I just want to confess it. The other one's like, what? I think it was clear to everybody that, that the rabbi and I were talking and that the two of you kind of get left out and I was actually thinking right now I was feeling a little bit bad and the third one says, what, are you out of your minds? I was the one who was just thinking, how am I going to apologize for the two? I feel like I kind of took the rabbi's time and attention away from the two of you, and we just talked the whole night, and the two of you didn't even get a chance. And at that moment, the three of them walking home fell silent, for they realized what had happened. And so it is with the word of God, that the word goes forth, and each person swears that the word was for them. That is the mystery of the sermon. Bringing a word, creating a space, giving a gift in which each person goes, that was for me.